guys, I'm Kelowna, and since Halloween's nearly upon us, I'm doing something a little different this week. Everyone spends Halloween in their own way. Some people go trick-or-treating, some people go see a scary movie, or go to Halloween parties. For me and my friends, we play horror-themed board games. Now, I've been a huge fan of board games ever since I was a little kid, and in the last 10 years or so of attending conventions, I've gotten to play more in-depth tabletop games. So, for today, I'm here to list off 10 different horror-themed board games that you and your friends could play this Halloween. And with that, let's begin. This is Halloween, this is Halloween. Pumpkins scream in the dead of night. This is Halloween, everybody make a scene. Trick or treat till the neighbor's gonna die of fright. So, before we start, a quick note. This is not a top 10 list, so instead I'm going to be ordering these from generally least complex to more complex, starting with 1 as least, up to 5 for most. Now, your mileage may vary with these, so take it how you will, but let's get started. Number 1. Werewolf. Number of players, 7 to 21. Length of game, 30 to 90 minutes. Level of complexity, 1 out of 5. Werewolf is a game of hidden identities and deduction, and you've probably played something similar to it even if you haven't played the actual game itself. Games like Town of Salem, Mafia, and Resistance all share the same basic structure as Werewolf. There's a group of people trying to figure out who certain traitors are by talking out their suspicions. The game also requires a moderator who isn't a part of that round to go through each day and night cycle to make sure that everyone's doing the right thing, and also to make sure that they're not cheating. Though different versions of the game have their own twists on the format, the typical game of Werewolf has four different roles that players can have. Villager, Werewolf, Seer, and Doctor. The game plays out in a series of days and nights. Each night, the villagers all close their eyes while the werewolves silently choose one player to kill, then the Doctor silently chooses one player to save. During the day, players find out which villager was killed the night before, and then they hold a discussion trying to determine who is the werewolf. At the end, they then hold a vote, and one player is put to death. Once a player is voted to die, the moderator reveals that player's role, and the game continues. The villagers win when all the werewolves are dead, and the werewolves win when they are no longer outnumbered by the villagers. A lot of the fun of Werewolf comes from the conversations it creates, with everyone trying to pick apart the words and actions of other people to determine if they're villagers or werewolves. If you have too many people to play a more standard board game, this is definitely a good thing to play to spend a night. Number 2. Shadow Hunters. Number of players, 3 to 7. Length of game, 30 to 60 minutes. Level of complexity, 1 out of 5. Shadow Hunters is a board game in which each player has a hidden identity which the other players are trying to figure out while moving about the board collecting items and fighting one another. The game has an anime aesthetic and covers a lot of tropes in both the monsters and the hunters. At the beginning of each game, every person is assigned a different character. Depending on the character you're dealt, you're going to be on one of three teams. The hunters, the good guys, the shadows, the bad guys, or the neutrals, who aren't really a team but a group of characters just out for themselves. Each character card has a certain win condition on it, but generally, the shadows want to kill the hunters, the hunters want to kill the shadows, and the neutrals are kind of just doing their own thing. The neutrals each have their own individual win conditions. Some are collecting all different kinds of items, and some are just surviving until the end of the game. Because all of the characters' identities are hidden at the beginning of the game, you have to use both the game mechanics and deduction to figure out who's a friend and who's an enemy, and play your moves accordingly. On each turn, a player rolls dice to move to another area of the board, with each area having different effects, like drawing cards, healing or hurting players, or stealing items. The cards come in three different types, white, black, and green hermit cards. The white and black cards either have an immediate effect upon being drawn, or then act as equipment cards to give characters new abilities. The hermit cards are special in that they're designed to help you get information about other players' secret identities. Each one has a statement about a player's role on it, like, I bet you're a shadow, if you are, take damage. A player then draws one to read it, then hands it to another player, who either takes that damage or says, nothing happens, which gives some information about their identity. Using all of these resources, characters are trying to find out who their allies are, if they have any, and then make their moves accordingly until their goal is met. A lot of the fun of this game comes from just trying to figure out who everybody is, based on who they're attacking, what moves they've done, that kind of thing. Number 3. Mysterium. Number of players, 2 to 7. Length of game, 45 minutes. Level of complexity, 2 out of 5. Mysterium is a different take on a murder mystery game, with one player taking on the role of the ghost of the victim, while the rest of the players are psychics taking part in a seance trying to figure out the killer's identity. 
There's a couple of problems, however. The ghosts can't directly communicate with the players, and they only have a jumbled picture of the circumstances of their deaths, which leads to the psychics trying to take everything that they're being shown and make it into one coherent picture. Mysterium is a cooperative game, with the ghost showing each psychic projected visions made up of abstract images to try to help that player figure out the person, place, and thing involved in the murder. The psychics are individually assigned one of each to have to guess, and they have seven rounds to identify those three things. The ghosts can provide them a different vision each round, giving each set of psychics visions for first the suspect, then the location, and finally the weapon. One of the biggest challenges comes from the vision cards themselves, which often are very complex images with a lot of different details in play, and the ghost has to group vision cards together in hopes that they'll combine in a way that helps the psychic clue into specific details they're trying to get across. Each time a psychic makes a guess, the other psychics can use clairvoyance tokens to guess if they think that that player is right or wrong. Getting these clairvoyancy votes correct makes the last step in the game easier for everyone, so it's helpful to do that even if it feels mean to vote against a teammate. Once everyone has solved their visions and correctly identified their suspect, location, and weapon, it then moves into the final phase of the game. Only one of the psychics actually has the real answer. The group of psychics is given one final vision by the ghost, which is more detailed if they've gotten more clairvoyancy points during the game. After that's done, they then hold a vote to try and guess which culprit is the real one. If they all vote correctly, everyone wins. Mysterium is a great example of visual design in board games, with really strong artwork in the design of the board and pieces, as well as the vision cards themselves. As far as the actual game itself, the experience of trying to get inside your friend's head to figure out the interpretation of the weird vision they just gave you is always a fun time, and can lead to some great discussions after the game where you can compare your logic with what the ghost was actually getting at. Because of the sheer randomness of the vision cards that could be assigned, and having those be assigned to different culprits, no two games of Mysterium are going to be quite the same, which definitely helps a lot with replayability. Number 4. Betrayal at House on the Hill Number of players, 3 to 6 Length of game, 45 to 60 minutes Level of complexity, 2 out of 5 Betrayal at House on the Hill is a board game that mixes up basically every horror trope that exists, from zombies to dragons to banshees and everything in between. Players are explorers in a spooky house, finding new rooms until a special event called The Haunt is triggered, in which one player is then pitted against the rest in one of 50 possible scenarios. The players take turns exploring doorways to find out what room is behind them, building the game board room by room as they go. Each time a new room is explored, different effects can happen, like events and items that can change a character's stats. At a randomly determined time, the haunt will begin and one player will be designated by the game as the traitor, with the rest of the game playing out based on one of the game's scenarios, which is selected based on the state of the game at that time. The heroes and the traitor will read about the specific haunt in their own book, with each team having information and goals the other team doesn't know about. The rest of the game pits those teams against each other, whether it's trying to finish their own goals, fight the other players, or possibly both. One example of the haunt is Checkmate, where the heroes have to play a game of chess with the Grim Reaper. Excellent! The good guys have to run around the house and collect items that will get them ready for their fateful chess game, boosting their knowledge and increasing the result of a roll of the dice that will determine the winner, while the traitor makes every effort possible to get in the way, going as far as to fight and kill the heroes. The game's appeal just comes from the pure variety that it has that no other game really does. The way you build up the house, the different item and omen cards that you can get, and the fact that there's 50 different scenarios that you could play from either side really shows just how much different variety this game has. And if you happen to ring out everything in this game, well, don't worry, there is a brand new expansion that offers 50 new scenarios and tons of other content. If you're a fan of Cabin in the Woods, you're probably gonna like this game. Number 5. Last Night on Earth Number of players, 2 to 6. Length of game, 90 minutes. Complexity, 3 out of 5. Last Night on Earth is a board game that pits players against each other as either zombies or heroes in a variety of different scenarios. It's deeply rooted in a lot of the tropes of zombie fiction, with a light-hearted twist on the different kinds of dangerous situations that these characters could find themselves in. The players are split into teams depending on the total number of players, some controlling zombies and some controlling heroes. There are five different scenarios to choose from, or play at random, from a simple Heroes vs. Zombies deathmatch to a handful of objective-based modes. Heroes can be tasked with destroying zombie spawn points, finding fuel for the getaway truck, that kind of thing, whereas the zombies are going to do everything in their power to get rid of the heroes. Each scenario lasts a specific number of rounds, which allows a little bit of customization for just how long things will take. 
A round is split into a zombie turn and a hero turn, with the zombies going first each round. During the zombie turn, the players on that team move around their zombies on the board, draw new cards, fight the heroes, and try to spawn more zombies. On the hero turn, those players move their characters, trade items between heroes, complete objectives, and fight zombies. Both teams play cards and fight each other, trying to get the upper hand whenever they can. The heroes win if they manage to finish their goals in time or not die, and the zombies win when, well, they eat everyone. The appeal of Last Night comes from its mix of both strategic gameplay and tongue-in-cheek humor. The actual game, though, can get pretty intense, with just a single dice roll possibly deciding the fate of the heroes. To break the tension a bit, the cards that affect the gameplay often use zombie tropes in a fun way, like This Could Be Our Last Night on Earth, which makes one male hero and one female hero skip a turn because, well, you know. The different scenarios, playable characters, and board setup make this game have a lot of replayability, and if you want to get into the spirit of things, it does come with a soundtrack that you can put on while you're playing. Number 6. Tragedy Looper. Number of players, 2 to 4. Length of game, 90 minutes to 2 hours. Complexity, 3 out of 5. Tragedy Looper is a board game in which one player plays a mastermind who has trapped the rest of the players in a time loop scenario from which they're trying to escape. The game does come with a number of pre-made scenarios already for you, but does allow for customization if you want to try and create your own. Depending on the kind of scenario you're playing, that will determine how many time loops there are, as well as the plots and characters that will be involved. The mastermind knows everything and holds all the cards, but needs to win every time loop to win the game. If the protagonists can successfully win even one loop, they win the whole game. Each loop consists of several days. In each day, the mastermind moves characters and triggers events, after which the protagonists move characters as well. After each day's events play out, the protagonists try to use these events as evidence to figure out what scenario is happening. Because it's so likely that they're going to lose a given time loop, the important thing is to find out what circumstances lead to them losing that loop to try to prevent it next time. If the mastermind can stay ahead of the game, adding in new wrinkles with each time loop, then they win. But if the protagonists are quick on their feet and manage to avoid all the slogging through of the plots, then they can win. However, there are a lot of plots and characters that could work for different scenarios, so it can get a little bit overwhelming for them at first. This one might take a little bit of getting used to when you're first playing it. Once you have the basics down, though, there's a lot that you can get out of the game, and the fact that it lets you create your own storylines to expand the game makes it technically the most replayable on the list. A bit of special advice, if all of your group of friends are playing this for the first time, you want to assign whoever's probably had the most experience being either a GM or a DM as the mastermind. That's basically the kind of role that they'll be playing in this, and you want to make sure that they're reading through all the rules first, so that way the game can go a bit more smoothly as you play. I was drawn to this game because I'm a fan of the Zero Escape series of visual novel games, and I got a similar experience of trying to solve a mystery made more complicated by messing with the flow of time from Tragedy Looper. Number 7. Dead of Winter. Number of players, 2 to 5. Length of game, 60 minutes to 2 hours. Complexity, 4 out of 5. Although there are a number of Walking Dead tie-in games, Dead of Winter is probably the one that actually feels the most like you are a part of that universe, even though it isn't actually based on The Walking Dead. Each player controls a group of survivors working towards an overall goal to keep them safe, healthy, and not eaten. Along with this, however, each player has a secret objective that their group is trying to meet, and only players who have met their secret objectives when the game ends will win. To throw a wrench into things, there's one secret objective that will make one player pit themselves against another, effectively making them a traitor. Like a lot of zombie fiction, the zombies themselves aren't the biggest problems. The cold weather, the scarce resources, and other players' intentions are actually your biggest threats. The game board represents the colony itself, with the other location cards around the outside to represent the other places the survivors can go. On every turn, a crisis is revealed, setting conditions that players need to meet to prevent a certain negative effect from happening. Each player then takes their turn, moving around the board, collecting items, fighting zombies, basically doing whatever it is that they need to do to meet their goals. Then you get the colony phase. That's where food starts to become more scarce, people start getting into fights, and that's where a lot of the harsher realities of a zombie apocalypse come into play, and where a lot of the harder decisions you have to make will happen. The game is made more interesting by the special event cards called Crossroad Cards, which have a chance of being triggered on every player's turn depending on what they do, and require that player to make a choice that has consequences that affect the game in a bunch of different ways. If the players become convinced that they know which character is acting as the traitor, they can then exile them from the community, which changes that character's objective and no longer allows their survivors to enter the colony. 
The thing that makes Dead of Winter really feel like a zombie apocalypse game is the fact that everything can go to shit really fast. Survivors can be killed at the drop of a hat. The situation becomes more and more stressful as food and morale run low, and the danger of another player fucking you over and ruining everything is always there. If you ever wanted to know how Rick Grimes probably feels about managing everything, then this game's gonna give you an idea. Number 8. Fury of Dracula. Number of players, 2 to 5. Length of game, 2 to 3 hours. Complexity, 4 out of 5. Fury of Dracula is a game in which one player controls Dracula who is trying to secretly exert his influence over all of Europe while a team of hunters tries to track him down and kill him. It's directly based on the Bram Stoker novel with a Victorian aesthetic and the characters being the characters from the book. Lord Godalming, Dr. John Seward, Van Helsing, and Mina Harker. The game's board is a map of Europe with the different towns and cities being connected by railways and roads. Turns are split into day and night sections. During the day, the hunters move around the board trying to pick up Dracula's trail, gather supplies, and eventually hunt the vampire down and fight him. During the night, the hunters are able to find more resources, find more clues, or take a time to rest, but Dracula also has the opportunity to lay more traps and create more vampires to make it harder for the hunters to find him. Dracula can increase his influence over Europe by killing hunters that happen to find him, and through special encounter cards that he can subject the hunters to. And, if he gets his influence up to 13, he'll win the game. If the hunters manage to figure out Dracula's location, they can try to limit his movement and box him into a certain location, where they can then fight him. If they manage to kill him, then they win. However, if they don't, he can escape and then try to prolong the game, trying to increase his influence. This game is effective because it manages to capture the feeling on being both sides of this conflict. Dracula feels like a puppet master pulling the strings from the shadows while the hunters are trying to all work together to fight a villain they normally couldn't fight on their own. Whichever side you're on, it definitely fits the aesthetic of the book. If you like the sound of the game but want something a little simpler, you can try Letters from Whitechapel. It's where you play as a group of detectives trying to track down Jack the Ripper. It's a very similar game in that a group of players are searching for a hidden solo player, but it does away with the combat, ending when Jack is tracked down by the cops. It focuses much more on the hide-and-seek aspect that's present in Fury of Dracula, but it's overall a much more streamlined experience. Number 9. Dark Moon. Number of players, 3 to 7. Length of game, 60 to 90 minutes. Complexity, 5 out of 5. Dark Moon is a game of hidden identities that plays out on a space station in peril. The ship has a bunch of different systems that need to be maintained, lest the cold, unforgiving vacuum of space kills everyone in a horrible manner. At the beginning of the game, the players are dealt both a character and a status card. The character they're playing is public information, but the status is kept secret, because that's how you'll know if they're infected or uninfected. If you're an uninfected player, you need to complete three events, which then leads to one final event, and if you win that, you win the game. One of the players starts the game as the commander, which lets them choose between two events for the group to tackle each time one is completed. Players work together to complete events by rolling dice and contributing results to the greater effort, and each event needs a certain number of successes to complete. On top of these events, players are also just trying to stay alive, since there's a lot of different ways for you to lose just because the systems aren't maintained properly. It's kind of hard to fight infected if there's no oxygen. If the shields or life support fail, for example, you're all boned. So sometimes player actions will have to be spent to make sure things are working. If you're infected, you need to do everything you can to sabotage the completion of these events without having the rest of the players catch on to what you're doing. Subtlety is the name of the game with the infected, because if the uninfected players realize that you are infected, they can stop you from causing trouble pretty easily. Because of this, it can be a little intimidating to be an infected player at first, because you need to do something to affect the gameplay while not giving away the fact that you're secretly a bad guy, which can be kind of hard. Honestly, other than the interesting nature of the game's dice, which can be weak or strong depending on the status of your character, most of this game's complexity is mental rather than mechanical. As games like this go, there aren't a huge amount of mechanics to keep a track of, but if you're playing as an infected character, there's a lot of mental gymnastics to try to keep a track of, and that can be a little tricky. This game is interesting because it was once known as BSG Express, which is a fan retooling of the Battlestar Galactica board game meant to make it a bit more streamlined to play. The connections to BSG are pretty clear, with some people on the ship being secretly evil. Cylons and shit. Though it can be tough for everyone to play their roles right, if everything is working, you get a really cool experience and some really awesome paranoid conversations between the players. If you're into science fiction body snatcher stories and don't mind a bit of a learning curve, then this game might be for you. Number 10. Eldritch Horror. 
Number of players, 1 to 8. Length of game, 2 to 4 hours. Complexity, 5 out of 5. What horror collection would be complete without a little bit of Cthulhu? Eldritch Horror is a cooperative game in which a team of investigators must work together to gather information and resources to prevent the awakening of one of the Ancient Ones based on the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Before each game, the players choose an Ancient One to use for that session, which determines the events that they will encounter and the goals that they'll have to meet to win. Though the lose condition is pretty much the same in all of these, some big scary thing from another dimension is gonna come to fuck shit up. Players move their investigators around the world, encountering various events in different locales to develop their stats, find clues, and eventually solve mysteries which can help them prevent that game's Ancient One from waking up and really making a mess of things. Much like the humans in Fury of Dracula, on their turn they can move between cities, gather items and resources, or recover their health, but each of their turns ends with an encounter that's different based on the different locations that they're in. Depending on the character's stats and the roll of the die, these encounters can have positive or negative effects, from providing extra resources to leaving the character with a status affliction that will make their life much harder. After those encounters, you then have the Mythos step, which is when gates all over the world open up with monsters pouring in, and the planet generally moves one step closer towards doom. Although in this case it's actually literal because there is actually a literal doom counter. The Mythos step basically puts the players on an increasingly stressful countdown clock, as each step both leaves them with less time to work and more obstacles to overcome. Fighting monsters really isn't that complicated, being solved relatively easily with just a roll of the dice, but it can waste valuable time that you could be using to solve some mysteries and generally getting closer to winning the game. If the players manage to solve the number of mysteries that correspond to the chosen Ancient One before it awakens, then they win. If not, well, it gets kinda ugly. This game is actually a streamlined version of the Arkham Horror games, which involve even more mechanics and are overall much longer and far more complicated. While I recognize that Arkham Horror is good in its own way, Eldritch was just a better fit for the group that I play games with and the amount of time that we tend to spend on games. For me personally, I do kind of have a limit of time that I want to play for games, and Eldritch is kind of getting close to the end of that time limit, but I recognize that it is something that a lot of people want to play. I know a lot of people are interested in the other games like the Arkham Horror or Mansions of Madness series, but if you've never played those before and are curious, this is definitely a good gateway to see if that's the kind of game that you might be interested in playing. So those are 10 different games that you and your friends could be playing this Halloween. I generally tend to get my games at local gaming shops, but if there are any near you, you can always get them at local retail stores such as Target or Barnes & Noble, or at the very least, Amazon is always a really great resource for board games. This is only a small taste of the numerous types of horror-themed board games out there. What kinds of games would you guys play that I haven't listed already? Post your thoughts and comments below, I'm really curious to see what games you guys should think should be on this list. Well, with all of these games at the ready, I am definitely going to be having an awesome Halloween weekend. I'm Kaluta, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye! You better pay attention now, cause I'm the boogeyman. And if you wanna shake in, there's something very wrong. Cause this may be the last time that you hear the boogie song. Whoa! Hey guys, if you like my work and want to see me do more, then check out my Patreon page. By pledging a certain amount of money a month, you get special perks, including picking topics for my videos. Every little bit helps. So check it out if you've got an idea in mind for a future video of mine. Thanks, guys! Geek Vision.